Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Colette Basilier. Um, I'm the executive director of Public Interest Technology New England, and we are a new regional consortium for public interest technology in the region. Um, so that means that we gather leaders from academia, government, private sector, and nonprofits together to talk about how we can leverage our regional resources to create programs around public interest technology for a larger impact. Um, I'll talk about an example of one of those programs later on, so I won't get too in-depth in it. And then a little bit of a personal background. So I have my master's in computer science from UMass Amherst. Um, I went to industry for a bit and worked as a software engineer. So I have that bit of technical background. Got laid off last year like a whole bunch of other folks um, and ended up um, connecting with a grad school mentor and taking this job as um, the executive director of Public Interest Tech New England. So we launched last October. Um, and I'm really excited to see the growth of our region and to start to spread this idea of public interest tech around um, more nationally. So a quick agenda. I'm going to talk about what is public interest technology because most people don't know what the term means necessarily. We'll talk about that case study from one of our programs. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion or chat, whatever it turns out being. And then I'll conclude with um, some final notes. And feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, I'm not super strict about Q&A stuff, so happy to make this more of a discussion than anything else. Um, so what is public interest technology? Um, no one really has a strict definition at this point in time, which makes it a little frustrating to define it as an academic field or just kind of any sector. Um, so public interest technology, as defined by UMass Amherst, is um, the focus on the development and realization of social responsible solutions to challenges in a tech-driven world. Um, the MIT technologist defines it as a new multidisciplinary field that emphasizes the benefits that flow from both old and new technologies and the way that they are used. Um, and then finally, the Ford Foundation, who was the first foundation to really come up with this idea of public interest technology, defined it as, um, or said, modeled after the framework of public interest law, Public interest technology works to ensure technology is designed, developed, and regulated in a way that protects and improves the lives of people, centering values of equity, inclusion, accountability, where the public interest is at stake. Um, so as you can see, these are pretty similar, right? They're all getting at the same set of core values, but they're tackling it in slightly different ways. Some people, when they talk about public interest technology, are really focused on government, and they think a lot about how um, technology and government interact and how those types of sectors can start to collaborate together. Um, other people have a more broad focus, so things like climate change, right? That is affecting the public sphere in so many ways, so how are we using technology to address those types of challenges in our communities, both hyper-localized and international? Um, another set of values is this equity, inclusion, and accountability. Um, those are really big. We see a lot of issues in the world today with AI and how um, models are getting released into the world. And California has this bill that's being um, working its way through the government right now to think about how we can create accountability around this. So that is like a public interest focus, I would say. Um, so what does PIT look like? So PIT is the acronym for Public Interest Technology. We all hate the term. We're trying to figure out how we can not call it PIT because it sounds bad. Um, but these are kind of the six core values that I like to think about personally. Um, so it's community-centered. And when I say community, I don't mean we are the community creating the technology. I mean, who is using this technology? Um, how is it going to be um, like integrated into our society? And who are the folks that are all along that chain that are going to be interacting with it? Um, so that means it's not only developers, but it's also the people who are deploying it. It's the people at the businesses who are going to be using it. And then it's the community members who are going to be interacting with it every single day. Um, so how do we integrate each of those um, types of groups into the actual development process so that when we are um, deploying these technologies, we can ensure that they're safe? We're also trying to bridge the gap between policy and technology. So thinking through um, how we can ensure that we are working with whatever power structures we have around us. Um, a lot of this is based in US research at this point in time, but we recognize there's an international implication for it. Um, but how are we looking at how policy is interacting with technology, and how can we use that to strengthen um, the thresholds of how technology is going to be harming or interacting with the public? Um, a big one that open source also recognizes is this approach to problems in an iterative, inclusive manner. So technology is never just one and done, right? You release it into the world, but then you have to think about what are the ways that it is going to be 
um, used in five years and how are the technologies going to evolve and how do we make sure that we're continuing to um, iterate on those solutions in a way that makes sure that they're still as effective as they once were. Um, using technology to generate public benefits and promote the public good. This one's a little bit more obvious. Don't do harm. Make sure that whatever technology you're creating is not just out in the universe to be out in the universe. There's an actual cause and a purpose behind it. Partnerships across sectors is a big one. So when we think about technology, right, it's a lot of these like, we're going to contract out to this company to make this thing, and then they're going to send it back to us, and then they're going to send it to the next person, right? Public interest tech is all about integrating those teams together. So how are we thinking about um, if the government needs an app to track um, how the ocean levels are rising, how can we make sure that that team is integrated across all of the people who need to be um, involved in that project instead of just kind of these like subcontracts that often miscue somehow the, um, the goals of the project and then we end up with a suboptimal solution. Um, and finally, a recognition that tech is never neutral. So um, releasing technology into the world, like I said before, is not just this solution that you can say, yay, we did something awesome and I never have to think about it again. Tech always has some sort of impact on society. We hope that it's good. It can, it can be bad, but it's never neutral. So how can we make sure that we're taking accountability when um, we are deploying technology? So who are public interest technologists? This is from the Ford Foundation. Um, they're activists, they're artists, they're coders, they're community organizers, they're educators, hackers, public servants, security advocates, tech advisors, and so much more. So we like to think about public interest technologists not only as the people who have that technical background necessarily and stepping into the room to talk about how we can create technical solutions, but also those who really care about how technology is impacting their everyday lives and want to leverage it for the better. Um, so public interest technologists actually skew a wider range of identities professionally, I would say, across sectors. And where is public interest tech? Um, so it's actually everywhere, which is so cool. So in the private sector, um, we think about the people who are creating the cutting edge projects. Private sector can usually move a little bit faster. Um, and they attract employees and customers. So how can we use the values of public interest technology to make sure that those products are actually being used, like I said, in the public interest? Um, civil society holds everyone accountable, right? They're the ones um, consuming all these projects. And how can they leverage tech in their communities to make sure that it's helping them instead of hindering them? Um, government is using it. Um, and also, they are in charge of policy and regulation. Um, so we need to make sure that there's tools for them in order to use technology easily. And in addition to that, we need to make sure that they're educated enough to create meaningful policy and regulation. In academia, they're doing a whole bunch of research around public interest tech. And they're also educating the next workforce to be able to engage with this type of technology in a way that is meaningful and impactful. And they're ready to make that social impact. Okay. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. So that's a little overview of public interest technology. And as I was getting ready for this talk, I just was inspired by this idea that open source is a tool to advance public interest technology. So when we think about PIT, the field is so diverse and it's so broad at this point in time. And like I said, no one can really agree on a definition. But what we can agree on, I would argue, is that open source is actually one of the best tools that we have right now in order to advance this field in a way that is impactful and makes sure that technology is opening up to communities because we have a lot of the same values of things like transparency and accountability, right? So I want to talk to you today about a case study from this summer program that I ran um, where we used open source as one of these tools to advance PIT and then have a little bit of a discussion around um, how this might impact different types of projects. So that's where I'm going with all of this. OK, so my case study. So um, back in May, we actually ran our first program as um, the nonprofit Public Interest Tech New England that we called the Impact Technology Fellowship. So this was a program for undergraduate students. They were all from technical backgrounds. And like I said, the whole idea of this nonprofit is that we want to leverage regional resources in order to create a larger impact. So what that meant is that Boston University Spark program, which is housed over in um, the computer and data sciences faculty, um, which is that Jenga building uh, just down the street, um, they have a really good experiential learning program. And they are really good at recruiting projects from community partners who need technology support but might not be able to support it themselves. And there's a whole bunch of other schools that want to get integrated into that work and maybe have funding or speakers or housing that they can provide students over the course of the summer, but not that experiential learning infrastructure. So we brought all those together to create this program. 
Um, so it was six weeks full-time in person in Boston, which was awesome. We had six different projects from community partners across sectors from climate change to city councilors in the city of Boston. Um, and our goal was to create a deliverable that could be handed off and maintained by our community partner in a way that they could go out and use it for years to come. So this was tricky because I mentioned we have partners, right? Our partners were not technical. That is the main piece of this. So our partners were researchers, a city councilor from Boston who we'll get to in a moment. We also had uh, a new nonprofit from journalism who wanted to get really involved in the Boston voting ecosystem. Um, so thinking about these partners, right, we had to create technology that could be handed off in a way that it was easy for them to use and designed in a way that they could use their tech literacy, which is not as in-depth as a bachelor's in computer science, let's say, in order to make sure that they fully understood the implications of the technology we were giving to them and making sure that they felt comfortable using it and deploying it into their communities. So the District 4 team. Um, so Boston District 4 City Councilor is currently Brian Worrell, um, and he was inspired um, because BU Spark had actually previously designed this app for District 7 in Boston. Um, and the goal of these apps is to enhance community engagement and connectivity. Um, so it can be really hard sometimes for city councilors to actually engage with their constituents, right? How do you make sure that everyone's reading their announcements? How do you make sure that they can effectively ask questions? And what we're starting to see is a lot of people like mobile devices more than anything else. So how can we make sure that they are using um, what they have access to in order to get the resources that they need um, to be an engaged citizen. Um, so the District 7 app has been open source before, and he said, this is awesome, but I need something a little bit different. I need it to be customized. So what my team did this summer is they actually created um, a new version of that project that is also open source and a little bit easier to customize so that um, other city councilors can then, therefore, go forward and move this. One second. OK, um, so the app features include, <coughs> sorry, there's something in my throat, um, an events calendar, a resources page, announcements, mailing list, and civic association. So these are all different tabs on the app itself. And they are actually, like within the open source project, really easy to go in and link different aspects of the app to so that you can create new tabs, you can create different tabs, kind of whatever you need for your district itself to be able to um, effectively engage with whatever the constituents need in your community. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, technical considerations. So this was the important part to advising this project team, right? It wasn't about how do we create the best technology, right? It was more about how are we going to use technology that we can hand off to this city councilor who has minimal time, minimal resources in order to engage this app effectively? Um, so the important one was we need a really simple interface for non-technical folks to update. So does anyone work with Strapi here? OK. So <coughs> sorry about that. Strapi is an API that is um, really easy for non-technical people to go in and integrate and basically it's a live API so it automatically updates whenever there is new data in so it's essentially like updating like a Google Sheets or some sort of form like that so that they can go in and say hey I have a new announcement I have a new calendar event let's put that into the system and let's move forward and update the app with that way so it's really easy for non-technical people to update the app so we made sure that instead of having to go in and actually um, put new things in the database or update the repo in some way, the city councilor actually just has to go in and update Strapi. Um, we also wanted to use very stable packages and libraries to ensure that the app doesn't need constant maintenance, so they chose React, Postgres, and Firebase. We needed to minimize security vulnerabilities, um, so we made sure that we were not saving any PII or any personal information that could get hacked. Um, we needed the app to have as many accessibility features as possible for those District 4 citizens. Um, and we wanted to make it really easy to clone and customize. So that meant that documentation had to be really on par and we had to make sure that it was very easy for any other city councilor, not even from Boston, to come in and be able to customize this app to make it their own. So um, this is the link to the GitHub. I highly encourage you all to check it out. 
Um, but just to say, this team is not the only one who is really excited about creating an open source project that could be used more widely across um, like not only cities, but the world, really. Um, so students, what I found this summer, were really passionate about working on these types of projects with social impact components. They were really excited about digging into the problems, not only in the sense of, let me learn really um, in-depth knowledge about React and Firebase, but also let me think about what District 4 needs. Let me learn from the city councilor to think about what are the social impacts, what are the constituents needing, and how can we make sure that that's easily accessible. How are we designing the menu so that they see the first thing that they need every single time they log into the app? Um, I also recognize that internships are really hard to get for a lot of these students. And what that means is they are constantly looking for projects to come forward um, so that they can work on something outside of their academic and professional work. And finally, um, contributing to open source projects is a really good way for them to add to their resumes. So I highly encourage them to look for this type of work, but it's sometimes hard for them to get integrated into these communities, learn the rules themselves without that sort of mentor figure. Um, so these students are really excited about it, and I was highly encouraging them to look into open source, but at the same time, I realized that we almost need to bridge this gap between kind of our students' needs and also like the type of open source I was teaching them, which was a little bit different, right? We weren't designing for programmers. We were creating packages, but we were still creating open source code that can be easily replicated um, in communities who need it with minimal technical experience. Um, so the first discussion question that I want to pose to you all today um, is who is the audience that you create open source projects for and how can we adjust this to focus more on the public interest? Um, so like I said, the projects that we were focused on were more on community partners. We were thinking of our audiences as people with minimal technical experience who just want something that's easy to maintain. They need a website, they need an app, they need something where they could post information regularly and then receive feedback back. Um, and how do we make sure that those things don't have as much um, security vulnerability as maybe hosting a database? So for example, one of our student teams, um, they had a, a person who said that they wanted to create a mailing list or they wanted to make sure that they could have feedback from users. So the student team was like, okay, cool, we're gonna make a database. And we were like, wait, 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 why are you making a database? And they were like, well, they want a mailing list. So therefore, we should have a database somewhere that they can have a database of all of the things that they need. And then we kind of had to teach them and take a step back to say like, that's awesome, that database was your first thing, but our nonprofit journalist does not know what a database is. So therefore, let's make sure that we're not overwhelming him with all these security vulnerabilities to think about. So just those little types of things are so important when we're thinking about public interest um, in open source projects. So, Opening up for discussion now, if you have any thoughts about this question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, just to play the devil's advocate mm -hmm. a little bit, how do you balance uh, like the ease of use versus uh, maybe like a recurring cost, because if you kind of sell host your database, you're not uh, probably going to be paying as much like every every single month versus if you pay for a Firebase instance or something. So how do you balance the ease of use versus like the cost that's continuous? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So the question was, how do you balance the cost of maintaining the app itself versus the ease of use of the app. Um, and I think that that's a conversation that you have with the actual person you're developing the app for. Um, so it's, it's not always the same based on wherever you are, right? So um, in our instance, we had the conversation with the person to say, hey, if you're going to want an app, this is how much it's going to cost to host it. This is what it, the kind of br monthly breakdown is going to be. And that was a cost that they were willing to incur. Um, so I think that it's that conversation, again, with that pit value of community-centered design to make sure that that's something that they're willing to accept. And if they hadn't said that, then we would have to make adjustments to make sure that they had um, either some other way to approach the system or another solution that we could have come up with. So it really depends on the person that you're working with, I would say. And then in creating an open source project out of that, that's something that you detail in the documentation to say, hey, this is an open source project where we're doing this thing, this is what we're accomplishing, and here are kind of the implications of what you need to have as a requirement in order to create this project on your own. 
Um, so that's how we approach that problem. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. No, of course. Um, so this is very similar to the work actually that I've also done in the past two, three years actually. Awesome. Uh, so we have this club at BU called BU Hack for Impact and we also code for nonprofits. Uh, but one question that I had was how does Pitt kind of, you know, like there are hackathons today and there are like these clubs which incentivize students to gain like experience, uh, you know, and you via fellowships or some kind of an unpaid internship. But how does like Pitt work towards people, pro professionals or in the open source community to like for with actual adults who have like probably full-time jobs or like full-time roles to kind of impact the community on the side when they are free. Uh, because I think that's more of a tougher job to ex to kind of in incentivize someone who's way more experienced than students. Uh, whereas like, you know, students are very easy to just like resume experience and a lot of just getting to learn the basics, right? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, how do you incentivize those who aren't students, who are working professionals, who might not have the time to do these types of projects to pursue Pitt efforts? Um, and that's why I'm here giving this talk, honestly, because um, I'm trying to get as many people integrated as possible because I recognize that um, it's not often talked about, kind of. Like, a lot of, the, a lot of the values you bring to the workforce are established when you're in a class in college, right? Like, you learn about these are the things, and then it's kind of work culture on top of that um, that builds your professional identity. Um, so I think that trying to integrate this as wholly into curriculum, so at least like now that you are graduating and going off into the workforce, like you have this idea or this notion to even look for those types of opportunities, right? So that's a start versus it wasn't necessarily pursued where Do I was. Do you think yeah. companies should have like, so the way they have an OSPO office, they should also have like something linked to their ESR where there some of the developers can kind of contribute to ESR, that company can contribute to ESR by giving their time to these nonprofit projects? I would love to see that, yeah. Because so again, this is this field is based off of public interest law, um, which is this idea that we should be giving back to public communities um, through our law communities. Um, so why not tech, right? It's the same idea of like, sure, we have pro bono lawyers. Why don't we have pro bono software engineers? Um, and there's some organizations like the US Digital Response who are getting closer to that. So they basically ask software engineers who are a little bit further along in their career to volunteer on projects that local governments come to them with to say, hey, we have six weeks, we need to create um, a multilingual website because right now it's only available in English, we don't really know how to do that. So they work with the local governments not only to get this project off the ground, but also increase their technical literacy so that they can be able to maintain this and ask questions in the future. Um, so I think that type of work is what's really important right now is moving forward not only in the sense of delivering this technology to community partners, but also increasing the technical literacy so that they are able to step forward and say, hey, this is what we need. Hey, turns out um, we're really not up to date on our little security um, vulnerability, so therefore we need to do that. But it's just such a scary concept right now to a lot of these organizations who are not necessarily technically educated. So it's really this two-piece project, right? It's like not only creating the technology, but also educating them. And I think that that's where we as developers can come in sometimes and almost bridge this gap and act as a translator to say, hey, I want to do the work for you, and I want to work with you to make sure that you understand everything that's going on. Cool. Yeah. I can repeat your question if you want. Okay, sweet. So I actually um, just completed an internship at Red Hat for user experience. Congrats. So this is like, thanks. So this is like super awesome to me to see um, increasing accessibility in communities. Um, and I'm wondering like from a user experience perspective, maybe you, you mentioned this before and I missed it, but how do you all go about establishing where you're starting in these communities? You know, what kind of technical literacy you're starting at and you know, what essentially the current pain points of these people are, and how do you go about deciding what you can do to improve that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I could speak to the way that Boston University does it, and they actually kind of take um, community partners through a process of not only starting with, um, like, where, where's your technical literacy, right? Because we also acknowledge, like, we don't want to bring in a partner and scare them. So we don't want to bring in a partner and start talking in all this technical jargon, and then they're like, I need to run away like I'm never using technology again, right? That's not our goal. Our goal is to make sure that they feel comfortable and confident maintaining this. Um, so it's kind of starting with this baseline evaluation of 
Um, what does it mean to be engaged with technology? And then once you get to the point where you can actually start having those conversations, then you can start discussing with them um, what do you need? What are you lacking? What are the pain points? Um, and those are conducted via um, user research um, interviews. So we do a lot of those. Um, and then it's not only stopping at that, but this community-centered design means that every single iteration of a UI design, we say, or every single iteration that we have an MVP that we're able to deploy, they get feedback on that. So they get to say, hey, I love the way this looks, or I actually don't think that's going to work because of X, Y, Z reason. So it's not only that like we figured it out at the beginning, we defined the problem, it's at every single step that we can possibly ask them a question, we're asking them a question until we get to the end. So it's not that massive gap of like, hey, we delivered the thing, and they're like, that actually doesn't work for us, right? Because these people's time, often community partners' times, are so valuable. They are so spread thin, and they do not have a lot of time to contribute to us, so we want to make sure we're not wasting it. So even taking that 15-minute meeting to show them any type of project or any type of progress is really valuable because it means at the end we're not going to need a three-hour meeting where they're just like, this isn't going to work at all. So I think that's the way that we go about it. Cool. Any questions? Yep. Uh, quick question. Did you, do you have, uh, are you establishing corporate partnerships too, like, um, for example, uh, with technology providers, cloud providers who might be able to uh, augment, like, open source development and contribute, you know, free resource. So in the case where you did need a database, maybe you got a, you know, Amazon can donate a managed database of such a size, and that would be a great, I mean, that would be a great resource. It would take a lot of load off other people, yeah. Right, yeah. So we haven't pursued that quite yet because right now we're relying a lot on university partnerships and because universities technically have those agreements, um, we've been able to use that. So our goal, yes, in the future is to kind of establish those on our own front so that we can be able to be a little bit more independent of universities because one of the problems that community partners have too is like you're restricted to that academic schedule, right, when you're working strictly with students. Um, and that doesn't always work for everyone. So how do we make sure that we can um, be as flexible as possible with them? Um, so yes, that is one of the goals in the future to think about working with um, larger corporations to say what are the resources you could give back to communities and how can we then fill in the other resources that the region might have in order to create these projects. That was a great question. Thank you. Other questions? Thoughts? Shannon? Cool. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, yeah, so, and then the other question that I have, and we don't have, we could bring it up after because I have another slide that I want to share with y'all, um, is like thinking about bringing more perspectives into open source. Um, so I thought that one thing that was really interesting that happened this summer is we had these experts in residence come in, and basically those were the folks who had more of a technical understanding of what was going on, but were actually situated in a different field. So for example, um, we had an expert in residence who sat on um, the WBUR newsroom, and he was a technical expert on a project with the NAACP that was looking at how is the Boston Globe reporting on different neighborhoods, and what does that mean for the racial demographics that are actually represented in their reporting. Um, so it was cool because because we had this relationship with the NAACP, we were able to bring in an outside journalist to have perspective on what the project should look like, what data visualizations would be most meaningful, in addition to the technical experts who came in. Um, and I just think that it w made the project um, elevated because we had this ability to ask somebody else from an outside perspective what was going to make the most impact. Um, and I think that this would be an interesting thing to think about in open source because I think right now, um, we have obviously a lot of contributors come in, but they're all usually technical, right? And what would be a path that might make sense for us to bring in perspectives that might be a little bit less technical, or maybe it's the folks who are going to be using the project in the end because instead of just having like the Q&A board where it's like, hey, this thing is broken and this doesn't work for me, or I would love this feature, right? It's like, how do we integrate those more into the process itself? Um, and how can those perspectives be a little bit less technical too? Um, so that is like kind of a, uh, a standing question that I'll leave you with um, as I wrap up all of these slides. Um, this slide is always fun. How can I be a public interest technologist? Um, these are some of the ways, because I recognize um, in a nine to five kind of professional sense, sometimes it's difficult to think about what does it mean for me to be a public interest technologist. And even when I was a software engineer, I remember sometimes it was hard to even approach these types of topics with my manager and be like, hey, 
why don't we have an enlargement feature on our website? Um, and I remember we were working in pathology, and I was like, hey, we should have like a text enlarge feature. And he was like, they're pathologists. They have to have good vision. And I was like, that's a horrible assumption to make. I actually don't like that. I was like, they could still wear glasses. Like, we don't want them wearing glasses all the time. So anyway, um, these are kind of the things that I've brainstormed. Um, find ways to work effectively with others. Um, in different industries, um, attend trainings to learn more about your domains and how it relates to society. So I think that as technologists, it's really powerful when you can actually be the translator between technology and X, whatever X is. Um, so find ways that you can um, increase your knowledge base to help out um, with those. Usually it's like a vocabulary gap, right? Basically build your vocabulary and the other thing to be able to translate. Um, call out where technology can improve the public good and question if technology needs to be created at all. That's also a valid question. So you got opportunities to include the community in design and implementation, use responsible data collection practices, advocate for industry standards that enforce um, pit values or are centered around pit values, and then pursue a role where you can apply technical skills with a public interest problem. That's kind of a stretch, right? Those are the people who are like, go run to government jobs. And that's not my perspective on all of this, but at the same time, it's a cool thing to think about, and they're starting to pop up more on boards like um, the All, All Tech is Human has a really nice job board around this. So like, it's a cool thing to think about that there might one day be a pit job board that we could all go and look at. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just had a question. So one to understand, can public interest technology only be nonprofit, or can it also be for profit, wherein like people can be incentivized to work on it uh, as their own project or like something that they can profit off? But like it's based off impacting or improving society in any Yeah. Way? Oh, that's a really good question. I think that it can honestly be for profit as well. IBM has some really great um, projects right now that are in the public interest, I would argue. And then if you look at the whole climate change industry, yeah. like that's yeah. for profit, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon as you look at climate change, you're like, oh yeah, no, they're making money off of that. But at the same time, like they are very much changing the world in a way that is for the public interest so we can have a planet to live on at the end of it all. So yes. <laughs> It's um, definitely across industry. And then um, just to conclude and to leave you some resources, so um, the public interest technology mindset, um, it's a mindset. This field is growing. It's very flexible. But it helps us to think about um, what are the skills that we can employ that will help society interact with technology in a more impactful and positive manner. Open source is a tool that we can use to promote public interest technology. So as you're going about these projects, think about the little ways that you can improve documentation or Ask somebody a question that you might not think to ask originally so that we can create this technology that's a little bit more um, inclusive of the public interest focus. Um, try and create partnerships and advocate, and oh yeah, creating partnerships and advocating for communities when they cannot be involved is always a good first step. Um, and the public interest work will never be done. Um, so if you want to contribute to the public interest tech workforce to create these community-centered designs and solutions, there's lots of opportunities. Um, some more resources to think about. Recoding America is a book that talks about kind of how, from the government perspective, technology has failed the government so many times and how we can go about um, actually integrating technologists into government to help so, uh, solve some of those solutions. Coded Bias on Netflix is an amazing one that just kind of talks about how technology has failed a lot of society. Um, volunteer for the US Digital Response, which is what I mentioned before. Um, there's pit at UMass events um, that are usually open to the public that I highly recommend. Um, All Tech is Human on Slack and LinkedIn, actually, I have a great presence. Um, they're always posting about kind of what is new, what you should be checking out. And finally, publicinteresttechnologist.com with dashes in between um, is a great resource. Um, it's a little out of date right now, but it's still really cool to think about um, all of the ways that um, not only academia, but industry are engaging in these types of topics. So. I'll stop there and open it up for um, a question or two. We have a few minutes left, if there's anything else. Yeah. Um, can I get the microphone? Oh, sure. Um, thanks. That was wonderful. It was very interesting. Um, so by, by way of background, um, I'm a professor of the social sciences at Colorado. I'm a statistician and demographer by training, but I work in a sociology department. Um, 
we've noticed in the past that with the training that our students get, um, which is really rich training and uh, qualitative methods and yeah. for interviewing, um, we've had a number of students go on to successful careers in UX design. And, and so that's kind of like the entry point, I think, into this world for our students. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited about these ideas. And I'm trying to envision now how I pitch to my dean the development of like a four course certificate in PIT. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't work enough in your world to understand um, what those courses would look like for tech majors. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, um, you know, if, if we really take this um, th this call to inclusive practices seriously, right. um, I see that extending to pedagogical inclusion as well. So with the tech majors that you have, is there some kind of partnership that could be formed across departments in the, say, social sciences, and maybe computer science department or, or what have you to develop a, a program that would um, kind of leverage everybody's uh, capabilities towards these endpoints. Absolutely, yeah. And there's actually a few courses I can point you to that are currently being established. Um, so actually, Pitt at UMass Amherst specifically actually has a Pitt certificate that they just started working on. Um, and that has a foundation course of like intro to public interest technology for every single major, no requirements needed to take that class. And it really goes through like looking at the lens of what does it mean to live in a socio-technical society, and therefore what are the things that we need to learn and um, be able to talk about and engage with in order to make sure that we are citizens in that society as well. So thinking about things like um, data privacy, um, what does it look like for the policies that's regulating technology right now, social media is a big one. So as soon as you take that lens of like, how, what are the, the core values that we need to share as anyone who engages with technology and society in order to make sure that it's impacting our lives in a positive way to benefit the public interest, you can start applying that to every sector, right? Um, so there's a lot um, that I know that's going on with social media classes that are kind of crossing journalism and communications majors, which is really interesting. Business schools are super excited about this, especially because the startup world and entrepreneurship is very much impacted by this um, public interest tech focus. Um, climate change and any of the like geology, oceanography stuff, they are very excited about this work as well and thinking about how technology can be used um, with their research and to change the planet in little incremental ways. So it's pretty easy to get everyone very excited about this topic as soon as you start talking about it in terms of values and skills as opposed to technology top down. So that's my short answer to your question. And we're out of time. So thank you so much everybody. I appreciate you showing up today.